In D.C., President Trump's comments about using the military to quell protesters are drawing criticism from both his current and former defense secretaries. Weija Jiang is standing by for us at the White House. So, uh, Weija, yesterday, two days ago, it was the former uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. Yesterday, it was former Defense Secretary and Marine General Jim Mattis who issued a strong rebuke of President Trump, saying that he is a danger and doesn't understand the Constitution. How is the president responding? And explain to our viewers what's unusual about General Mattis's comments. Well, you know, less than a year ago, our David Martin sat down with General uh, Mattis for an interview uh, for CBS Sunday Morning. And during that interview, he very specifically said that he would not speak ill will of a sitting president. He did not believe that was productive. Um, he mentioned an unusual relationship he had with the president, but he wasn't going to go beyond that. So something snapped. Something changed his mind. Um, and that was clearly what he watched, along with the rest of the country, unfold very near the White House. Um, he criticized the action against protesters. He criticized the military's involvement. And he criticized President Trump because he accused the president of being the only president in his lifetime that did not try to unite the country. He said, uh, Mr. Trump doesn't even pretend to try, but instead tries to divide the country. In fact, he said that, um, you know, using forces against protesters is a deliberate act to try to create a false conflict between the military and civilians. And, you know, I think that, you know, it was difficult for him and other military leaders to just sit back and watch because they have dedicated their entire lives uh, to serving the country, and they have a very different understanding of when the military should be used than President Trump, and that's why he spoke out. Um, the president, not surprisingly, responded on Twitter, um, and he attacked uh, uh, General Mattis, saying that he was never, uh, you know, he was never really known for his, his military uh, service, but rather his public, um, uh, his public, public relations ability. But, you know, guys, it was President Trump who nominated uh, General Mattis to be the Secretary of Defense, right? And so Mr. Trump is the one that brought him on board after claiming that he only brings the best people. And so now he's singing a very different tune and they are engaged in this war of words. Um, but it, it is surprising that uh, General Mattis would go as far as he did. This was a really lengthy response and really critical of President Trump. Um, meanwhile, the current defense secretary, uh, Mark Esper, is, is finding himself in a bit of a pickle about uh, the use of military force to quell the protesters. He spoke yesterday. Let's play a little of that sound. I say this not only as secretary of defense, but also as a former soldier and a former member of the National Guard. The option to use active duty forces in a law enforcement role should only be used as a matter of last resort and only in the most urgent and dire of situations. We are not in one of those situations now. All right, Weija, can we talk about the significance of him, him making that formal announcement? Well, he is directly contradicting President Trump, who less than 48 hours prior to uh, Secretary Esper making those comments said from the White House Rose Garden that he would deploy the military to cities and states if they didn't control the violent protests themselves. Um, he's been urging everybody, really, to call on the National Guard to get involved. Um, and, and many states have said, we don't want your help. And beyond that, if we're not requesting your help, it is not legal to send it our way. And so President Trump was going to invoke or, or threaten to invoke the Insurrection Act, uh, which could have allowed him to send in troops anyway. Uh, and Secretary Esper, in those comments, the, his next sentence was, I do not support invoking the Insurrection Act. So that is yet another direct con contradiction to President Trump. So he's really standing firm and saying, uh, despite what the president wants and his desires, he does not agree with it. And so yesterday I asked uh, the White House press secretary, Kayleigh McEnany, whether the president still had confidence in Secretary Esper. And she said, as of now, he does. Um, but it was far from... Uh, you know, an endorsement of the secretary. 
And it sort of left me wondering whether we should be checking the president's Twitter uh, feed for some announcements, because, you know, this was not um, something left open for interpretation. Esper could not have been more clear that he disagrees with what the president wants to do. And, and to the point that you were making earlier, Ouija, uh, uh, General Mattis, uh, Secretary Mattis in the Atlantic wrote uh, this, that we must reject thinking of our cities as a battle space, referencing what Secretary Esper said on that conference call to governors. And uh, uh, General Mattis went on to say this, at home we should use our military only when requested to do so on very rare occasions by state governors. Uh, and you know, the reason I'm, I'm focusing on this, Ouija, is because the president and his administration have made a number of comments in the, uh, recent days uh, all around these protests that have been happening uh, uh, for George Floyd, but overall for police brutality in this country, including comments like the president saying that he was just inspecting a bunker, uh, asking Americans to believe that in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the division that we've seen all across the country with thousands, if not millions of people taking to the streets all around the world, that this would be the time that the president of the United States would happen to go down into a bunker to inspect it. Uh, they get into a semantics discussion with Kayleigh McEnany and the White House press corps over whether or not it was tear gas as opposed to pepper spray. And then the president of the United States on his Twitter feed seems to indicate that he gave General Mattis the nickname Mad Dog, which of course is not true. That nickname has been uh, part of um, uh, General Mattis' moniker since 2008. And so, you know, I know these are little things, but they all add up. If the president is willing to be, uh, uh, to misstate the truth when it comes to just a nickname for a general who's had a nickname going back to 2008, what else can we trust the president on? Well, they are little things, but they are actually very meaningful, as you say, Vlad, because they do add up and they, they bring into question the president's credibility and and beg more questions about why it's important to him um, to portray the truth in a different way than the truth. Um, and so, you know, there was widespread reporting about the bunker incident, for example, um, that he was rushed to uh, the, the shelter when the protests were unfolding for safety reasons. And that seems pretty rational, that if uh, there were a questionable situation out here near the White House that, of course, he would be taken somewhere for protection. But, you know, it's really important to the president to maintain an image of strength and to be the law and order commander in chief. And so we know that he did not appreciate the coverage of that because he didn't want people to know that he uh, was taken to that bunker. But when he says things, Vlad, to your point, it often raises even more questions. He said he was going to inspect this bunker, but he also admitted that he's been there before. So if he had been there before, what's the inspection for and why is it his job to inspect it? So again, a lot of questions that the press secretary refused to answer. She said she was not gonna go beyond what the president said about that. So we're left in the dark about that. But um, you know, it, it's just one example of so many that you pointed out that just leaves people asking, what's the point? Um, and so, of course, all of this is coming as we are leading to an election. And often a lot of what we've seen the president choose to say and do publicly, um, because he hasn't been able to go to rallies, one could, could, could view a lot of his statements as also looking towards the election. So I want to give you uh, some statistics from a new CBS News poll. 58% of Americans disapprove of the way the president is handling race relations. Um, this is, of course, coming on the heels of his less than stellar reviews for the way that he's handled the COVID-19 pandemic. What sort of impact do we see this having on his reelection hopes? Well, President Trump would say that, you know, it, it doesn't reflect the truth because he continues to argue and, in fact, continues to tweet and, and say uh, verbally when he has the chance that he has done more for the African-American community than any other president, except for maybe Abraham Lincoln. And so he continues to bring up a different set of numbers um, uh, of unemployment and of home ownership and of um, you know, all these things that he believes he has accomplished for uh, the black community. But he never really answers what's at the heart of the crisis that's unfolding right now, which is whether he understands the reason why these protests are happening.
And yes, they have to do with the economy. Um, and yes, they have to do with inequalities. But it is so much bigger than that. And even yesterday, during an interview with his first press secretary, Sean Spicer, Spicer asked him, does the country need to hear words of healing right now? Do you want to unite the country? And the president um, just went on a rift about how law and order is important. He did say healing is important, but he suggested that law and order is more important right now. He was asked about the anguish uh, among the protesters who are trying to fight for equality, especially in, in policing. And again, the president did not use that opportunity to show empathy. Instead, he used it to uh, rattle off a bunch of his accomplishments. And I think that's what's still missing here, is whether the president has a sincere understanding of why people are so outraged and upset, because he so far hasn't addressed the systemic racism. He hasn't even acknowledged that it exists. The press secretary has said he believes there are some injustices that happen. But we are talking about a system, and we're talking about whether he believes the system needs to be improved. And I try to press uh, officials here about what he's actually doing to change what's happening. Is there a legislative proposal that he can point to? Is there policy reform that he can show us? And so far, we're just being told that there are lots of options and proposals being floated around, but he hasn't committed to anything. In fact, yesterday I said, look, Vice President Joe Biden has committed to forming a national police oversight board if he's elected. Is the president doing anything comparable to that? Um, and, you know, no answers, no definitive answers. And that's why there's so many questions about whether he understands what people are really demanding when they're in the streets. And, and just Ouija, um, before you go, um, and Anne-Marie, you, you know, it's important to note, the president had that tweet pinned to his uh, Twitter account for several days that no one had, no president has done more for black Americans mm -hmm. than possibly uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, there are people living in this country today who know that Harry Truman, President Harry Truman desegregated the military, who know that John F. Kennedy sent a civil rights bill in 1963. He announced that bill, and it was Lyndon Baines Johnson who signed it in 1964, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Civil Rights Act of 1965. For this president to say that he has done more for black Americans than any other president, without taking that into account, the living history of people who are still around today uh, is, to your point, Ouija, a fundamental lack of understanding of the issues facing this country. And Vlad, yeah, he can Brad, say I, I, what I'm he really wants. I'm glad that you made that point. Oh. Sorry, Weija. I'm really glad that you made that point because that's a, that's what I've been thinking every time I see that tweet. And I also think, you know, the president loves to, loves to sort of rely on these statistics, jobs, um, housing, that sort of stuff. And it, it is really limiting the conversation when it comes to quality of life, safety, hope for the future. You can't just rattle off a bunch of numbers. The crowds that we're seeing now are not all angry black people. There's a very diverse crowd across the country taking to the streets. Race relations is not just about black folks, it's about all of us. And he consistently ignores that conversation. Sorry, Ouija. No, not at all. I was just going to say, I'm glad you said that because, um, you know, uh, regardless of how President Trump is framing the conversation, and what numbers he wants to bring up. We have our own numbers as well. And I was just going to point to the CBS News poll um, because I was chatting with our political director, Anthony Salvanto, about this, who has recently conducted new polling about registered uh, black voters and where they stand. 78% of those polled believe that President Trump works against them, while only 9% believes that he works in favor of them. And so regardless of what he says and how much he claims he has done, and, and certainly, yes, he has, uh, you know, passed different reforms. He has improved um, the unemployment numbers. He has boosted the economy. All of that is true. But there is still a, a discrepancy in how the president views himself in this community and, and what's really happening. And, you know, you have to wonder if that's because he's not having these really tough conversations that Americans are begging him to have. Americans are begging him to acknowledge why they're in the streets. And, you know, when he has these chances, when he addresses the public during national speeches, it's just like the elephant in the room, that he's not talking about 
he's not talking about the issues that people are fighting for. In fact, he's talking about a very small group of people who are taking advantage of the situation instead. Yeah, so true. Hey, Ouija, always great talking to you, getting your insight. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. So as you can tell, there's a whole lot to talk about. Um, and the conversation continues throughout the day, but especially at 5 p.m. on Red and Blue. Elaine Cano and the team are going to talk politics, though. You know, all the stuff in relation to politics, um, the news in Washington, across the country. So make, so make sure you tune in at 5 p.m. right here on CBSN.